So Michael Gerster's here this morning, and uh, I often talk about Michael when I'm doing this stuff, which is kind of weird in a way. Michael was instrumental in the launch of my visual facilitation practice, and he doesn't even know this story. So we were at WICA. My business partner and I, Alan Dieter, were at WICA, and we were having a meeting with Michael, and we were talking about the customer research that we had done. This is all going to come back to you, I'm sure. And we were looking for value gaps or gaps in the value stream and where WICA could, could find a new way to, to go into the market um, with a new story, a new brand-centric message. And <clears throat> I had taken the time to draw a picture of the market scenario. <laughs> and you stood up and pointed to the screen, and Michael said, yes, I can see it now. And that's his accent, well, it's the best I can do with his accent. And Alan and I were driving back to the office, and I said, we are using pictures from now on in everything that we do, because Michael recognized the actual problem by seeing it visually. True story. Uh, so it launched me, yeah, it launched me into the business. So. Um, so everything starts with a story. I love to tell this story. Um, this, uh, there's awards for who can guess. Everybody knows what the big state is, right? <laughs> What's the little state? Rhode Island. Rhode Island. So this, this uh, Texas rancher, farmer, or whatever, from, is visiting his friend in Rhode Island. And they're walking around the property. And the Texan, of course, is like, you know, this is a postage-sized piece of property compared to my property. You know, everything's big in Texas, right? So, so he says, you know, back at my place, I could get in my car and I could drive all day and I would never get to the end of my property. And the guy from Rhode Island goes, yeah, you know, I used to have a car just like that. <laughs> the point being, <clears throat> leave me alone, the point being, they were having totally different conversations, even though they were using the same words. And that is, in my mind, that is the biggest challenge to strategy, to any strategic thinking, is to make sure, it's really any problem, right, anything to be solved, make sure you're having the same conversation. Make sure that you're having common understanding and you're contributing to a pool of shared meaning. That's the work of a facilitator. That's what I do, and I do that with a lot of visual techniques. So, but let's talk about the, the topic is how do we do this with strategy? What is strategy? Anybody, anybody want to offer up what strategy means to them? <clears throat> and I know it's early, but you're all C-suite people. So if you don't have an idea about what strategy is, definitely call me when we're done with this meeting. <laughs> Any thoughts? Somebody? Yes. You know, that's the Harvard way of thinking about it. It's how you compete in the industry, or how, in your industry. It's, it's, the, it's how you're different, you know, how you're going to compete. What is, what is the way you're going to be different in the future? That's really what strategy is. Um, so we have, a, we have a person at the top who has a question about a goal at the bottom, okay? And you could have any different kinds of scenarios for how you get to your goal. So. The strategy is, in this particular scenario, we're going to take the river. We could take the mountains. We could go across the desert. But strategically speaking, our strategic approach is to take the river. Now, your tactics are things like use a boat. So that's really the difference. And that's at a very high level, but at a very basic, understandable level, that's what strategy means. And what I found out in the world is a lot of people confuse all that stuff. You know, tactically speaking, we're going to do this, 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 and this, but we forgot to think about strategy. You forgot to think about what's, what are the foundations of our tactics. We never had a conversation about that. We just dive into what we think intuitively is the right thing to do, but we've never been explicit about what we think implicitly, and we never shared it really in a way that everybody understands together. So what happens? We've all worked in dysfunctional organizations where that division's doing something that is different than that division, and then they show up in the same marketplace competing for the same customers somehow. Anybody run into that? Yeah, you know, shaking heads, people. So I've, I've been in that boat. So that's what strategy's all about. And we know that strategy is really hard to do, right? 
<clears throat> do we understand the challenges that we're facing? Are we going to succeed? How are we going to succeed? <clears throat> Excuse me. And lastly, are we in alignment about what we're doing? So that's what we want to get to. That's what we need to understand. This is where visual thinking comes in. What is visual thinking? Anybody have a thought? I know that Hannah knows this. Thoughts on visual? Anybody experienced visual thinking? I'm so glad you're here. Remember, call me when we're done. <laughs> we use pictures to solve problems. We use graphic. We use visuals. We use stuff you draw on that thing right there to solve problems. And there are real reasons for why this is important and, and great reasons why it works. 75% of your brain is devoted to vision. That's a lot. At least 25% of your brain um, to think about other things and, or to do other things, you know, all your other senses. That's not a whole lot left over. We process this image, that's a real number, 60,000 60, times faster than text. Not six times, not 600, not 6,000, 60,000 times faster. We remember information that we see, and this is any kind of information, specifically maybe text in this case, twice as long as, as, as what we hear. So you're going to remember that. Maybe you would have, if I just said it, you'd remember it for five seconds. Now you're going to remember it for 10 seconds. We remember information we see and hear four times longer. When you add visuals to it, pictures to it, six times longer. This is scientific fact. So how do we do this kind of work? I'd like to introduce you to Dan Rome, who is one of, I, I like to call him a mentor, but I've never actually met him. Can you have a mentor that you've never met? Anybody familiar with this book? Excellent. Call me when we're done. Uh, Dan Rome's book, The Back of the Napkin and um, Unfolding the Napkin, he's wrote a, written a series of these things, is all about how you do visual thinking. So to a degree, this morning is kind of a crash course introduction to this kind of work. So I'm going to borrow some of his principles in here. We're going to talk about them. There are three tools that you use when you do visual thinking. First of all, your eye. You see what's out there in the world. And then next, your mind's eye. And what we mean by mind's eye is I see all this stuff, but in my head, in my mind, I can picture, I can understand, I can visualize more of what's going on. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And then lastly, hand and eye. And this is the stuff that probably bothers most people when they say, I'm kind of giving part of this away, I can't draw. We're going to fix that for you this morning. So those are the three tools that we have. Who in this room does not have those tools with them when they wake up in the morning and when they go to sleep at night? Everybody has. So, so you all have what you need to do this work. So there are four steps, though, to doing the work with the tools that you have. The first step is you get to look around and you get to take in data. You get to see what's happening in the world. The next step is that you actually take the, the lines of sight and the impression of the space that you're in and, and the different planes of what you're seeing and the shapes and all this stuff, and you actually form up a picture in your mind of what's really happening. We all know that this is a chair, right? If I say the word chair to you in your mind's eye, it might not be green. It might be a rocking chair, because most of us need that. Um, it might be a step stool, but you have an idea of what a chair is. So that's what's happening in your head based upon years and years of information that's come into your brain. You have a framework of what that is. So we see things, but then we can go to the next step, and we can imagine well, how might that be different? What would be different about the world if this room didn't have chairs, if the chairs were all lined up around the corners? What might that mean, to, strategically speaking, to what I want to accomplish right now? So we get to use that tool. And then lastly, this is the fun part, at least for me, you get to show what happened in your head when you reimagined all of that data that you had framed up in your head. This is what visual thinking is. So when you're solving problems visually, you're doing that work. You're saying, how can we represent the world visually in ways that we can reframe it up in another fashion so that we can build a solution? And what's really cool about it is your mind, because 75% of your brain is devoted to visual stuff, works best that way. 
How many people say, well, I'm not a visual thinker. I think differently. You can be honest. We're all friends here. Good. Because when people say, well, I don't think visually, unless you're blind and you've never actually seen, you're probably lying to yourself. Because every single element of your world you framed up in a visual construct one way or another, or you couldn't walk from your bedroom to the bathroom in the morning. We all have the archetypes of what the world means to us, and it's mostly visual, so our brains work that way. We certainly process things in a lot of different ways, but that's the way we work. Okay, so this is the number one excuse. I can't draw. Raise your hand if that's you. Come on, be real. Okay. I want to say is yes, you can. That's a drawing, ladies and gentlemen. What I'm getting to is it doesn't have to be great. And you know, you're seeing pictures that I've drawn in here, and everybody says, oh, that's so cool. Well, I'm sort of a hack at the same time. So I can't draw either. All you need is that. You need some basic shapes. Anybody in this room feel like they can't draw those shapes? OK, it's all you need. It's really all you need to do visual work. That's right. These days, you get a lot of help out there in the world. So let's, let's look at some examples of how you use those shapes. So, so let's talk about a goal. We need three customers in Q2. OK, so here's our three customers in Q2, a plus sign and some stick people. That's not hard to do, right? That has a lot more meaning than just me saying we need three customers. All of a sudden, we're telling a story. Remember that whole point about the story? Visually, we're telling a story here. Here's another example. Well, I'm talking about our product attributes of bigger, better, and faster, and that's not very exciting. And, but what if I added some of these things to it? And I'm up at the wall, and I'm just drawing a few shapes. I'm saying, we really need to make things bigger, better, and faster. Now, all of a sudden, I've got a story to tell. I can wrap my head around this, because not only am I hearing it, you're talking to me about it. I'm also seeing what you just said. These are common shapes that everybody says, oh, I get it. Bigger, better, faster. All of a sudden, I can internalize this information. I can get very clear about it. Um, even this, this, is, this is great. Even the simplest picture gets us started. This speaks to not just demonstrating or communicating what I think, but helping people think about what's in their heads. So here's me. It's a similar construct we had before. And then here's our problem in the bottom corner. So we're looking at this picture, and who wants to push an idea forward about what's really happening in their head right now? What do you feel like you want to do? Anybody? Solve them. Why do you feel like you want to solve the problem? I don't like problems. You don't like problems? There's an intuitive thing going on here. And when I, when I say it, you're going to go, oh, yeah. Let's just do it. There's a big gap in the center. You know, if we go backward, I've got to fill that gap. Your brain says, I can't handle a gap. I need to fill it with something. And again, there's science behind this. We don't actually see fluid motion. I don't know if anybody knows that. Everybody knows that you have a blind spot, right? And you fill in that little blind spot. You can't quite see that. You raise your hand. Remember that from science class. <clears throat> well, actually what happens all throughout your entire day is you're not seeing fluid motion. You're seeing little snapshots one after the other of what happens. There's so much visual data coming into your head that if you saw everything fluidly, constantly, your, your brain would probably explode from it. It's too much. So your, your, your mind shuts down for brief instances. I don't know how many times a second it is. It's a lot. And then you fill in the gaps, and it feels like fluid motion. It's just like a, uh, a film running that way. That's the way the brain works. So we want to fill in those gaps. So what are you going to fill in the gap with? Well, I want to fill in the gap with what happens between me and the problem, a solution. That's how the brain works. That's why visual thinking and visual facilitation is so great. So we're going to do it right now. Yeah. OK. We're going to do something called drawing toast. Is anybody familiar with draw toast? It's a guy named, I think it's Dan Wujek or Steve. I can't remember his name. We'll find out later. You have paper and pencil? We're going to take just five minutes. And I want you to do this. Using only pictures to the best of your ability, draw how you would create. Does anybody need a pen? 
We got pens here. To the best of your ability, draw how you would make toast. I'll give you a little background on this. This is called design thinking. It's creating workflow around how you would make a slice of brown, crispy bread in whatever fashion you need to do it. What's interesting is while you're thinking about it is over in Europe, they use frying pans to make toast. They don't use toasters, or at least in some places in Europe. Michael, do they do it in Germany with a toaster? OK, OK. Maybe it's only England they use the advance in technology. So take a couple of minutes and draw just a picture, you know, how you make toast. And I'll start the timer. Give you five minutes. I might actually short change you a little bit because I want to get into some other stuff. I would play some music. Maybe I could sing some toast drawing music. <laughs> this is the part of the video where you can go and get a glass of water. And if you're done, sort of raise your hand or something. It, it shouldn't take you more than just a couple minutes, but some people are slower than others. OK, getting a lot of people done. Give you maybe one more minute. Note to uh, self next time, don't look in the light of the projector when you're doing this, because now I can't see anybody. Yeah, that blind spot's pretty big right now. Everybody done? Everybody ready? Yeah. All right. Who would like to share their picture of how to make toast? All right, we got a gentleman in the back. I don't know if everybody can see this. So we have a piece of bread, goes to a stick figure of a person, that person walks over to something that looks like fire. Is that right? And at the end of it, we have a piece of toast. Excellent. And your name? Tony Deacon. Tony, thank you. A round of applause for. Oh, I like this picture. Let's talk about this picture. Just drop a darn piece of bread in the toaster. That's all you need. One step is all you need. That's your pen, I think. Thank you. And. You are Ken? Ken. Ken. Round of applause. Ken did excellent work here. Who's got another picture they'd like to share? This is supposed to be shareable. Frank's picture. Oh, man. So this is a little more elaborate, similar in that we have a table, because it's important to have your toaster sitting on a table and drop a piece of toaster. But the, the command or the uh, instruction to press the little lever. So Frank's picture, round of applause for Frank. Anybody else have a really interesting, oh, hold on, we got a very interesting one. So, and it's Keith. So pull a loaf of bread out, slice a piece off, toast it, butter it, eat it. <laughs> Excellent. Keith, thank you. Let's have a round of applause for Keith. Anybody else? Jay. Jay, I know you. Jay wants to share, take a piece of toast, put it in the toaster, and out comes a beautiful piece of toast. So thank you, Jay. Anybody? One more. One more. Anything that's incredibly great that we have to share. Well, so the point I'm making is that there are different ways to visualize this information. And from a design thinking perspective, what we're trying to do is get enough clarity so that, so that everybody understands our process or our thinking. But what's really interesting is that we're telling stories with pictures. And you know, unless maybe you came from another planet, you'd understand what these pictures are all about. And when you're done, it's an illustration that you can share with people 
and get deeper common understanding of what it's all about. From a design thinking perspective, we, you could look at the individual steps in here and figure, well, how many nodes does it take to create toast? And then how can we explore the step between the person getting the bread and holding it over to the fire? And let's explore what happens when they hold it over the fire, because I'm getting this visual understanding of what fire and toast means. Let's break that down even further. When you're doing it visually, it gives you the means to have, those di have that dialogue in a much deeper way than just kind of having a conversation about it, where all of a sudden people are all off and running with their own thinking. It wraps everybody around the common understanding of what's being discussed. Does that make sense? OK. I'm not going to give these back. I'm going to hold on to these. All right. That was five minutes. Perfect. So here's some of the funds. Um, this has to do with the hidden power, hidden power of metaphor to further get us thinking about what the heck we're talking about. So when I say something like, that's a dangerous thing to do. What does dangerous mean? Well. That could symbolize danger, right? That could symbolize danger. That certainly could symbolize danger. <laughs> Again, we're taking a visual and we're saying to somebody, I want you to feel what I'm talking about. I want you to process it on a deeper level. So there's a real difference. Did you, did you feel the difference between me saying something's dangerous and actually having a visual representation of what danger is. Metaphorically speaking, we're getting everybody to say, I'm not just kind of processing a concept. I'm going to deeply process a concept. Because now my mind is saying, hey, I'm, I'm using the largest sensory part of my brain in order to do this work. What, what is your thought on the danger with the skull with two bones kind of thing? Yeah, that's another yeah, danger. Yeah, conditioned to think it is danger over time by looking at the danger sign again and again. Yeah, yeah. So are you asking my, my uh, thoughts yeah. on that? I, um, so I agree with you, I guess, is my thought on that. It's that, you know. Even though it's not natural, natural. But yeah, you, you tend to, well, so the point is, I don't think anything's really natural. I think what happens is we, we learn this from the time we're infants. Yeah. You know, when you're an infant, you. You don't know what a bomb is. You exactly. Bomb an infant does not know any of this stuff. Or if you never live near a Ex cliff, you never know what Exactly. Is. So we learn, and over time, we all share mostly the common understanding of what these visual elements mean to us. Now, if you never saw a shark, but you knew dolphins, you might mistake the fin for a dolphin fin, and you might say, that's not dangerous. I love playing with dolphins. OK, so more metaphors. Um, what does growth look like? Everybody's seen that, right? But here's another picture of growth. And to me, that's a deeper, it's like, you know, we started small, but now we're bigger. Um, there's another version of growth. So if you look at these shapes, remember we talked about the fact that everybody can draw because we can all do this stuff. These shapes are not much different than what we saw earlier. Yes, agreed? So show of hands for people who actually can draw then. Can everybody draw? OK, excellent. Um, last one, here's, a, here's some samples, some examples. What does success mean? Well, we've checked the box. Oh, we've won the award. That's, to me, a <laughs> good example. <laughs> OK. Um, flow. This is kind of fun. We can show the flow of something just by showing direction. Again, it's like, I want to show you that we are going to go from action to results. I want to show you that we are going to saturate the market so we will win. That's the flow of what we're talking about. Adding the visuals makes it impactful, helps people understand what we're talking about. So pictures help us imagine and engage and understand. And lastly, somebody asked me this earlier, um, a line, I think it was Paul and I were having, was it Paul? We were having a conversation. Yeah. So here's, here's part of your conversation. Alignment, though, does not equal action. So how do we help people take action? And I, I believe, and this is part of the whole reason to do visual facilitation, we activate by codifying, by actually doing the work, by drawing the pictures, by making the documents, by having stuff when you're done that was the work we did together filled with all of these illustrations that might look stupid but still have meaning that we can then pick up and have a conversation and say, yes, we did it. It was what we talked about. We all understand it. We've codified it. 
we have something to work from, a blueprint to continue to work from. That's part of it. The other half of it is by doing the work together, by, by constructing these things together, we all have ownership of it. So that's why I would encourage you to not just do the work yourselves, but as you're working with people, give them the pen. Have them help in the drawing, because you know everybody can do this. Um, we're going to get into some work. I'm not sure how much time we have left. About 15 minutes or so? More time? OK. Questions before we dive into work? Because this will be, yes? Going back to another slide, you had the idea and the problem down here, the gap in between. Yes. Um, the main putting it together, is that also an explanation as to why we have difficulty doing things that are too large or two projects that are too big, and it works when we break it up into smaller segments? So, in my mind, yes. I think when things are too vague, when there's not enough of landscape established, we don't have enough data, that there's so many gaps we don't know where to start. Actually, I think Dan Rome speaks to that in his book. One of the reasons to do a lot of intake and a lot of contextual mapping of all the data and get it out in front of you is so that you start to see that landscape and, and um, hone in on where the gaps are that you want to focus on and construct things around where you think there might be gaps, but there really aren't. So, so yes. The gap is what over, over, uh, overwhelms us. So the converse of that then is if we narrow the steps too narrow or too small, does that inhibit us or do we then get into a different picture? I would, I would agree with that. Interesting question. Um, I'm trying to remember what he talked about in the book, but when there's so much information that you can't get a sense of the overall scope, um, I'm not sure it's gap-centric, but I know that it, it's, 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 uh, you're, you lose a macro view of things, and so it's too easy to get lost in the granular information. Um, Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, as, when, there's, when there's way too much information and you don't have a sense of the overall, let's just call it or, or organic, I guess, whole, um, yeah, you lose sight of what it is you're really trying to achieve. And, that, and that's why I think so many organizations struggle as they get into tactics. They don't really know what the big picture is. One of the jobs of a facilitator is to help people understand what they're really talking about. You know, how many times are you having that conversation from the very beginning? Well, I think I'm talking about the ranch, and it's huge. Well, I think you're talking about your car. Well, what is this conversation we're really having? So if you're lost in the, in the minutia, you can't possibly have that conversation. Other questions? Thank you. Sure. I've got one on this, because you, you use this um, metaphor with the, the gap there. Yeah. The visual. Would you say that that also applies to the other, like, auditory as well? You know, when, when you have a gap there that, you know, one of the biggest dangers is you, uh, what's it, you know, people who aren't comfortable with silence, let's say, hmm. that you, uh, you feel like, okay, well, I don't know what's going on. I see the space, so that's my opportunity to just talk and get into touch. As a facilitator, yes. I would definitely agree with that, that people like to talk. Um, I think silence is a really nice thing. I think the pregnant pause is a lost art. I was listening to something on NPR the other day, great commentary, I can't remember who it was, about the lost art of standing in line. And that what happens when we're standing in line now? We're pretty much looking at our phones and what used to happen before we had these things, people had the time to daydream. And actually, there was a, another commentary, a similar construct about that, that people are so distracted and so involved in the constant stream of information that no one stops long enough to actually process what's going on. So to speak to your point about not leaving the time to actually process, to daydream, to problem solve, you know, what are we going to wind up doing? It's an, interesting, it's an interesting pivot, I think, in society. I think it's a really interesting point. All right, other thoughts? I'm happy to entertain more, but I want us to work. And we may or may not work a lot, but let's see how much we get through.
Okay. Who's seen this kind of graphic before? Hannah's seen this. So what are these called? Everybody calls them different things. Quadrants, two by twos, whatever. Um, I just did a two by two yesterday with a couple that runs a small business. And one of the things they wanted to do in their workshop was talk about how we keep our marriage intact in this one year old business when we're both running the business and all we ever do is the business. And so we constructed this with different axes. Anybody want to comment on how this works? If you, so half the room has used them before. Does this mean you've used them and you don't really know why you're using them or how you use them? You plot your ideas. Yeah, I'm sorry? You plot your you plot ideas. You your ideas. And so what is important about plotting your ideas? Why can't you just talk about them? Gives you a visual representation of spatial placement of your ideas. Of the ranking. Ranking, placement. So all these things visually help you understand. I didn't plot anything on here. But, all the, but the spatial placement helps you understand how you feel about what, you know, what your sentiment is, how you might rationally make decisions. The couple that I worked with yesterday, we had two continuums. One was the negative or positive effect on the business. And the other one was the negative or positive effect on their marriage. And then we talked about their behaviors and their attitudes and their attributes and plotted them on the two by two. And so they could easily see what was really good for the business and their marriage and what kind of wasn't good for one but good for another. And then what to do about that, how to take action on that. I don't feel like we need to do this work right now. We're not going to do an example here. Here's another one. This is one of my favorites. Anybody ever do an empathy map? Um, oh, I didn't read it. So you're about to meet with an influential person. What is your goal and what is your strategy? How can you understand, strategically speaking, how I'm, I'm going to meet this prospective employer? Well, what do I need to talk about about myself? <coughs> That's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is, what the heck is going on with them so that, strategically speaking, I can prepare myself for how I get into dialogue with them? So you could create an empathy map. And all this is, is it, it, again, it's like plotting. It's like two by twos. It's pretty straightforward, easy to do visual thinking or visual facilitation that helps us get a handle on well, what is that person thinking about? What does that person see out in the world, in the marketplace? Maybe what kind of other candidates is that person seeing? What's that person saying? You know, what do I think that person says about who they need to hire? Um, what does that person hear out in the world about you know, the, um, the prospective talent pool? I'm sort of making this up on the fly. What kind of pains do they currently have? What kind of gains have they been making? If I were to plot all of my answers by proxy to what I think that person is all about, then I'm really well equipped to have a strategic plan to go in and talk with them. And it's really easy to organize it in my head and get my head around it. If I was just kind of thinking, well, I'm going in to meet with them, and I need to think about what I have to talk about, and I didn't codify it, there's somebody who said this a long time ago, if it's not written down, we don't really understand it. And that's just another way of writing it with visual placement so we get a sense of what it's all about. And if we had a picture of that person, <laughs> then it might make it even more tangible for us. Anybody ever work with personas in web development or things like that? Yeah, that's what a persona's for. It's really, so it makes it very tangible. That's visual thinking. All right. Yes? I think that's great. That gives you an idea of the strategy, which goals and objectives, and all the strategy that you want to take. Mm -hmm. But that's the concept, not the implementation. So when you come up with the tactical, how, does, how do you put the tactical in, into that entity? That's a great question. So let's assume for the moment that what they saw out in the world that you made the assumption what they, the, so the strategy is, I, my understanding is 
that they see a world where none of the candidates are really, really understand our, their, their vertical, let's say. So strategically speaking, I'd want to make sure I'm, I'm reaching them with getting them to understand that I understand their vertical. My strategy is to get them to understand the vertical. So tactically then, I would say, well, I could bring in those white papers that I wrote that specifically speak to their market. I could make sure that the blog post I write tomorrow before I go see them next week is all about their specific vertical. So tactically speaking, I'm saying I'm going to fill up their bucket with a lot of information that speaks to what they want to hear. I'm making it up as I go, but that's what I would say. So I've developed the, my strategy is to reach them on their turf. Tactically speaking, I'm going to I'm going to write some articles. I'm going to make sure I'm well-versed in their particular vertical. I'm going to come in with a couple of examples that, that let them understand that I do fit into their vertical. But if I'm talking about corporate strategy, then do I not need to do something similar to make sure that the tactical shows that I can actually implement it and the strategy makes sense or is possible or it's not just blue sky or whatever? But is, um, is, is, is conquering the goals and objectives of the company itself? Sure. I guess, is it a question or are you just yeah, making an observation? That, that, that seems to be more a broader base. There's, there's a lot of strategy up there that makes sense on paper. Mm -hmm. But when I look at it tactically, okay, either there's problems doing it or some impediments. So. Yeah, so this is a high level, a high level map of thinking. If we get into tactical planning, then there's a whole lot of other work that would be involved. We're, we're looking at um, things like creating broad goals, narrower objectives, planning around the objectives that are, that are tactical, that map to the metrics of the goals and all that kind of stuff. I guess, is the question, can we use visual thinking for that as well? Or I'm not sure I'm following the question. Well, my question is, is it a step process? Do you, do you think the strategy of isolating it? And it seems to me there's tactical and operational. Oh, definitely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so all I'm, all I'm getting to is that we can use visual thinking, I guess, at a very high strategy level. You can use visual thinking at any level that you want. And, and I'm not saying this is an answer to full-on strategic planning. I'm just, what I'm trying to illustrate is how you use visual thinking that way. So I'm glad you pointed it out, though, because frankly, again, people don't really do full str um, strategic planning. They're, they're usually stuck in one part of it or another. And so a, a real strategic plan is a multi-step process that has a lot in it. And, you know, if you've done a full strategic plan, you know that you start with things like vision and mission and goals and map everything you do to that and then get into your deeper tactical planning around objectives and metrics and all that kind of stuff. Um, okay. So, sure. Sure. So here's another way of, of sort of plotting things, but plotting them with some... Sentiment involved, this is something I created a couple of years ago and still use. It's getting into sentiment of how do we get a landscape of what's happening for our company. We're going to do another plot, but this plot is, well, what's really good on a big level, on a macro level, and what's really good on a micro level? What's really bad on a macro level, and what's really bad on sort of a micro level? So the, the metaphor concept is the rays of sunshine feel great. The flowers are kind of small, but nice. The clouds are overbearing and really hard to deal with. And the weeds are like we're stuck in the weeds. And you know, so there's a whole different feeling about being stuck in the weeds versus smelling the flowers. And it's a metaphoric representation of what could have been more of kind of a metric laden, you know, um, two by two. So it's a, it's a little deeper visual representation than a two by two. Anybody can draw a cloud, anybody can draw a sun. It's easy stuff to do. This is getting back to goal mapping. We did some of this earlier on a, on a lighter level, but here's us and here's the goal. This speaks to deeper strategic planning. So first of all, you're going to define who we are, then you're going to define what goals you're going after, why they're important, and then you're going to map out your obstacles. And you do this in a visual way. It's really easy to start thinking about obstacles when you consider what a mountain means. And it's somewhat spatial placement, but it's also storytelling. What obstacles do we have to get over, under, and through? The next step is to create narrative around these. Let's start telling stories about the journey we're going to take from us to the goals. 
And because we can draw these nice little squiggles, we could put big paper up in a room, we could get up at the wall, we could start doing it. Highly tangible stuff that makes it very visceral and very real. <clears throat> then you start to figure out, well, how do we really have to do this? So a visual way to get back, to get deeper into things like tactics and objectives and obstacles and success criteria. Tell a story, do it with pictures, it'll be really real, if you can say that. Um, this is a little bonus, just look that up. This is a really fun exercise for deep thinking and ideating. One person draws a, whatever it is they draw, a squiggle, the next person takes it and adds to it. And you keep going around the room that way until you get this big giant thing. So if you did it with a story, a story about your company, then you'd have this interesting kind of thing when you're done. So that's all I got. Have fun storing the castle. These are some resources. I'll leave this up here. Uh, I'd love to take a few minutes for Q&A. Yeah. Do we have time for that? I think uh, sometimes uh, uh, these things are for simplifying and putting in the right place so that it's easy for you to see. Yes, uh, yes. Sometimes, uh, 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 like London subway map, for example, if you draw it to the geographical thing, you're not going to get it because it's not going to look good. But mm -hmm. subway map, they draw it in a way, this is the north-south line, this is the east-west line. Yeah. Like uh, it's not to scale, it's not correct, but it gives a pictorial mapping of how the stations are positioned. Yes. So you get a better yes. picture than actually showing it on the map. In some yeah, place. yeah. And actually, Dan Rome in his book speaks to that. You know, how do you do a map that actually resonates with people um, I'm trying to remember the example. In other words, you're, you're, you're trying to capture the salient feature that is necessary for right. and ignoring other truth that is in Yeah, it. what's important in the view? And, and what he has in his map is, I, I can't remember the landmark, but there was a specific landmark, and it might have been London, um, where if you just put the landmark on the map and then you put a couple of other landmarks, it, got every, it, it helps you understand where it really is as opposed to a bunch of different stops along the route and you have no sense. No, it's by the Eiffel Tower or whatever. The big chicken. The big chicken. There you go. Exactly. Yeah. That's right, without the big chicken. Um, questions, thoughts? Yes, Carl. What's the story behind your business name, Rich? Dangerous Kitchen. Well, Dangerous Kitchen has a lot of stories. Um, the The honest truth, as opposed to the dishonest truth, is it's a Frank Zappa song. Um, but I always wanted to call a company Dangerous Kitchen for years, and then when I had the opportunity to name my business, I did some, some deep research into why that would or would not work. I was cautioned by a lot of, frankly, very older people. Uh, you can't use the word dangerous in your company name, but if you look at the psychology behind what brand is all about, and I do a lot of work in the brand space, um, brands that really work are brands that leave a permanent impression in your brain, not just something that is sort of catchy, but actually make an impression in your brain, like everybody knows where they were when 9-11 happened, that kind of impression. And so to a degree, it, it sort of almost doesn't matter what that impression is, as long as you're leaving an impression. Um, so, but it's, it's so highly evocative of what my company is now was just sort of the perfect storm to use this name. Uh, the word dangerous is evocative of the roller coaster ride that, you know, the work that I do is very disruptive. Michael can probably attest to that. We put uh, WICA through the ringer in a lot of ways, I think. Um, sort of, I guess, hitting everybody over the head about market approaches as opposed to sales approaches at the time. That was part of the work we did. Uh, so it's definitely a roller coaster. You could get hurt doing it, maybe, whatever. Um, and the kitchen is evocative of where creation happens. It's a very creative company, very creative approach to doing work. Uh, what you see in here is just my way of not having to write everything or draw everything live while we're doing it, just to make things go a little faster. Um, so that's the, the genesis of the name. There's a lot of other stories behind it, but we don't have time for that. Other thoughts, other questions? Yes? I want to share with you a, kind of a funny flip side of what you're doing here. Um, my oldest son is the best man at the wedding this weekend, and he's got to put together the speech and the toast. And he has struggled for weeks putting it together. 
but he's a graphic designer, he's an artist. Mm. And everything he does is visual. Everything in his mind is visual. So he had this collection of thoughts, paragraphs, ideas that he just couldn't put together because he's a visual guy. Yeah. So I had to spend time in the last two months to help him put it in a narrative because he can't, he can't do it. So he's really good at the 75% of the brain stuff, but doesn't really get, and there are a lot of artists like that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I guess to a certain extent I feel sort of uh, grateful that I came to do this, the visual work, later in, in my life because I, th I'm mapping backwards what I always did kind of on the side and what people always valued, but I never really got a sense until that day at Waika when Michael said, I see it! Yes? I don't know whether I told you or not when we talked earlier, uh, there's a catering member called Mark Grace. How many of you know Mark Grace? And he's got a company called Visual Talking. Mm, I know that, yeah, that I name. I yeah. That yeah. Connected. Uh, and uh, basically, if you think about it, traffic signs, international travel, especially if you're going out of the country, it's not the reading that is as important as the signage and things of yeah. the like. And also these days, people are doing all the texting with all the, they don't mm -hmm. write full sentences anymore. So the uh, pictogram emo emoticons, yeah. they're also pic uh, pictorial representation of what they're feeling in some sense. Well, think so about the, Asian text. Too. Right. Yeah. So if you are facilitating where it's like men are from Mars, women are from Venus, the same way, people are different. Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 also different uh, cultures. When somebody in India says yes, that yes may mean something. That I don't want to say no to you. I heard you. So sometimes I heard you is yes versus I agree with you. Right. Those kinds right. of things can be confusing. In t sometimes you want to have confusion, obvious that you are not sending a wrong signal that you are cut, you are agreeing on. So right. To speak. So picture gives the vagueness in some sense in some context. Sometimes, it, yeah. So culture definitely plays a lot into it. Uh, there's no way around that. Um, you know, specifically things like color. You know, different colors mean different things in different cultures, too. So, I mean, it's a complex puzzle. I'm not saying, certainly, that doing visual work is a panacea for everything. I just think in a world of communication that's getting harder and harder to do, the more you can incorporate this kind of thinking into what you do, the better everybody's going to be. Uh, my experience with it is, and it's one of the core foundations of my business, that when you add visuals, it, everything just comes alive. Oh, and somebody's calling me. Sorry. And sound. Yeah, and sound. Other thought, yes. I'm, I'm happy to hang out as long as everybody wants to. I know everybody's got work to do, but we got a question in the back. So I am a certified scrum master, and, and I haven't specifically worked at a company that was going lean. Um, I've worked in companies where Agile was already implemented, and my job was to be a scrum master for the organization. Um, again, it, it's, I, I would say, I'm trying to think if there's a specific example, except uh, I would just say yes. I mean, the work that I did at the time was very whiteboard-centric and very much into um, helping the teams communicate really quickly and really effectively by doing this kind of work. I mean, as a Scrum Master, that's the job, is to do that, if, if that answers the question. Or close enough? OK. When you say video, I have one. It's called, um, it's explaining the new process of the making of a post. And it's called yeah, Yeah. Right? yeah. All you don't know what is all about. After 15 minutes watching this video, where a man prepares a post for his life. Yeah. Right? So you what is all about. Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah, so I would, I, would, I would say, I'm trying to think of the lean environments I've been in. And certainly there's a lot of things like radiators of that sort in that environment. So um, just using a Kanban board is a visual assist because it's, it's just getting out into a space where A, people can see it, which is important, but B, you get a sense immediately of what's in flow. 
I can organize by seeing. You know, one of the examples we didn't use today is everybody is a visual facilitator because when you draw a list on the, on the flip chart, you say, well, let's add graphics to that to make it speak. The simplest graphic you might use are bullet points. Those are graphics. And what they mean is, this is important, focus. It's a visual aid. Yes, sorry. Yes. You talked about the strategic planning process at the end. So my question is, um, the real part of a strategic planning process is visual thinking is most beneficial? Wow, I think all of it. Um, and I'm thinking about all of the strategic planning that I've done with various kinds of companies. And I think any time you're doing problem solving, and, and there's problem solving all along strategic planning, I think that visuals will help. I think as you get into the real weeds and the deep metric-centric tactical side of things, maybe not as much. But I think that the visuals that were created earlier on help inform that and help everybody you know, remember, if you're, if you're looking at a tactical objective that speaks backwards to a goal and you want people to understand why that tactic's there, if you did visual work while you were creating the goals, bring that visual along with you because it's going to help everybody align around, oh, now I got why we're doing this tactically. Um, you know, the, certainly the core vision work and understanding of vision and mission and uh, uh, barriers and, and all that kind of stuff and success factors. Visualizing that is a great thing to do, and I do a lot of that. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of times the work goes into committee, and I'm not necessarily part of that committee work. So I can't speak to some companies when they're doing it, um, although I try and hit them on the head enough and say, you can really do it. Don't forget to do it. Um, I think anytime you're having a conversation about anything, including where to go for lunch, a quick picture is going to just do a lot. Personal bias, maybe. You had a question. We use it a lot in our innovation sessions, but also in our proposals, we started putting more visuals. Mm. We saw a, kick, a big kick in our conversion rate. I, I think that is a great point. Every one of my proposals goes out looking exactly like the stuff you've seen here. Um, I think it's a differentiator, definitely. But I think that it helps people understand exactly what we're talking about. It start, I, I could show you one if you want to hang around. It starts with a picture. It says, what's the current landscape? And it shows a landscape. You know, so what we're really trying to say is what's going on. We understand what's going on in your company. And then we have a story of, you know, well, this person's not getting to that goal or whatever it might be. And it helps companies understand that we get it. And then the process, I've got workflow and all that kind of stuff in our proposals. Um, so that at the end of it, it might be 20-something pages, but it's telling a story of what the experience of working with us is going to be about. Instead of, well, here are the deliverables you're going to get when you're done, and it's going to cost this much money. I'd rather understand the story of how working with you is going to really happen than know that it's going to cost $1.95 and I'll get two pieces of bread when I'm done. So I'm glad to hear that, because I, I want every company to do work that. Well, I don't want every company. Companies not in my sector, I want to do that. Other questions? Sure. The only thing I would ask from you, if you have more stuff, want to know anything more about the process, whatever questions you might have, um, maybe write it down on your business card, or just give me your card. It gives me a chance to reach back out to you. I promise I won't give you a heavy sales pitch or anything like that. Um, but if you have more thoughts and want to know, just throw me a card with something on it, and we'll make it happen. Thank you so much for having me this morning. Hopefully you got a little out of it. Thank you.